What are you guys doing? Learning. Why? Well, we're about to do a video on learning. Isn't that right? That is correct. Good afternoon. I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today we're adumbrating the first part of Unit 6, Learning, in Meyer's Psychology for AP textbook. So let's get started. All right, let's jump right into it. So humans learn by experience. We aren't born with genetic plans for life, as are salmons, who are born knowing how to swim upstream, find their spawning ground, and either lay or fertilize eggs. The human race is also gifted with adaptability, or our ability to learn new behaviors in response to changing circumstances. Let's now define learning. We can define it as a relatively permanent change due to experience. And it's also important to note that we learn by association. The principle of habituation tells us that we will have a decreasing reaction to a stimulus when we're repeatedly exposed to it. First, let's discuss learning by association. If Frank eats a suspicious looking piece of candy one time mm -hmm. and it tastes really good, Frank will learn to expect that eating it the next time will be a satisfying experience. This is an example of associative learning, or realizing that some certain events occur hand in hand. In this case, Frank associatively learns that candy and palatable satisfaction occur hand in hand. Moving on to habituation. If I pretend like I'm going to punch Frank several times, he may flinch the first few times, but by the last time, he may not even blink. <laughs> There are two other terms we need to discuss here. Classical conditioning is learning to expect and prepare for significant events, while operant conditioning is learning to repeat actions that yield pleasurable results, or vice versa. Let's also make sure to take the time to admire this wonderful photo of Frank. Now Frank, tell me who the father of classical conditioning is. Happily. For the father of classical conditioning, look no further than Russian scientist Ivan Pavlov. He's considered the father of most of classical conditioning and this branch of psychology. His experiments regarding dogs provide a remarkably clear and simple example of classical conditioning. Pavlov took a group of dogs and noticed that when they smelled food, such as that In-N-Out burger or that Corona Extra, they began to salivate as a response. Then he began to ring a bell whenever they were served their food and repeated this for several weeks. After 20 days, he was able to cause salivation in a dog merely by ringing a bell. So when we look at the chart on the left, we see the different stages. First, he observes the food causing the salivation. Then he trains them to hear the bell in uh, agreement with the food arriving. And eventually, you have the bell simply leading to salivation in and of itself. Now let's explain this experiment using some vocab. The bell would be what we call a neutral stimulus or a stimulus that normally would elicit no response. The dog's salivation to food would be called an unconditioned response, or a naturally occurring response to stimulus. The food itself is an unconditioned stimulus, eliciting a reaction from the dogs naturally and automatically. The salivation to the bell would be an example of a conditioned response, since dogs don't normally salivate to bells, and it's only through association with food uh, over time that they start to salivate. And the bell itself is a conditioned stimulus, or a trigger to a conditioned response. Pavlov was very happy when this experiment succeeded. Or as Borat would say, great success! Anyway, let's take a look at some of the vocabulary that we just talked about and unpackage it a bit further. The process of linking a neutral stimulus to a conditioned response, which we just saw with the dog experiment, is called acquisition. And this process can be repeated again to create higher order conditioning. An example of this would be if Pavlov had turned off the light before striking the bell. Eventually the dogs would expect food after the light was turned off. On the opposite end of the spectrum lies extinction, or the process of removing acquisition. This would happen if Pavlov began to randomly ring the bell and starve his dogs. After only a few days, they would stop salivating whenever the bell was rung. However, sometimes spontaneous recovery occurs. If one of the Pavlonian dogs, years after the experiment, randomly heard the bell ring and began to salivate, 
That would be an example of spontaneous recovery. In real life, this occurs to soldiers with PTSD who will react on instinct to loud noises or other experiences reminiscent of the battlefield. Finally, there's generalization and discrimination. Generalization means that stimulus similar to a conditioned stimulus will have similar results, meaning that a Pavlonian dog might begin to salivate after hearing a church bell, doorbell, or similar sounds. Discrimination is just the opposite. It's the ability to distinguish between a conditioned stimulus and other neutral stimulus. If Pavlov uh, whistled instead of ringing the bell and the dog didn't salivate, that would be the dog exhibiting discrimination because it could tell the difference between the bell and the whistle. Abe, how did Pavlov and other psychologists of the time generalize their findings to the rest of the field? Well, Frank, Pavlov and another one of his colleagues, Watson, actually underestimated the relevance of cognitive processes and biological constraints. First, we'll discuss cognitive processes, which are thoughts, expectations, and perceptions. One term that falls under the umbrella of cognitive processes is learned helplessness, and that's when an animal or a human recognizes that an unpleasant stimulus is unavoidable and then gives up trying to resist it. So today, it's very hot, and I've decided to host a pool party, but my pool parties are really special. For one, I actually cool my pool instead of heating it because I want to build character in my guests. And two, only one person is allowed in the pool for the entire length of the party, and he or she must stay in the pool the entire time. So I have my friend Nixon here to make sure that rule gets enforced. In goes Frank, freezing his butt off. Now you can see, Frank is experiencing learned helplessness, because each time he tries to get out of the frigid pool, he's unable to do so. Eventually, he will just give up. There he goes. Now let's move on to biological constraints. The basic idea here is that the laws of learning in different animals are not the same. Rather, they're constrained by the animal's biology. So an animal's biology affects the way it learns. For example, if a mouse is sickened after drinking some flavored water, the mouse will likely be conditioned to avoid that flavor. Mice link the sickness to their sense of taste. On the other hand, if a bird consumes food that looks tainted and then it sickens a few hours later, the bird will know what sickening food looks like and will avoid it in the future. Birds link the, the sickness to their sense of sight. It's also important to note that conditioning happens faster when the conditioned stimulus is ecologically relevant. For example, human males associate the color red with women's sexuality. When female primates have their periods, they display red. When they blush, indicating flirtation or sexual excitation, there's more red. So wow, I know you guys can't see him, but Frank is sitting right next to me right now and he's getting really excited from this picture and it's starting to make me uncomfortable. Oh boy, there he is. Just look at that face. So there are two key ideas from Pavlov's work. The first is that for conditioning to occur, the U.S. does not have to immediately follow the CS. For example, chemotherapy often triggers nausea more than an hour after treatment, but cancer patients will still often develop nausea to the sounds, smells, and sight of a clinic. The second idea is that learning is how animals adapt to their surroundings. So what did Pavlov teach us? First, that classical conditioning is how organisms adapt to their environment, and he also taught us how to study psychology objectively. The basis for Watson's work was Pavlov's work, and Watson concluded that human behavior and emotion is a bundle of conditioned responses. For example, Watson wanted to condition his infant son Albert to fear rats. Watson knew that Albert feared loud noises, so each time he presented a rat to Albert, he banged a hammer against a metal bar. After repeating the procedure several times, Albert began to cry each time he saw the rat. Albert also displayed a generalization of his conditioning by bursting into tears when confronted with a rabbit and a dog a few days later. Alright Frank, now what's the other type of conditioning besides classical conditioning? Ah, now we come to the second type of learning, operant conditioning. 
The difference between the two forms of learning is fairly straightforward. Classical conditioning relies on respondent behavior. The dogs in Pavlov's experiment had to start salivating for the experiment to be considered a success. Operant conditioning therefore relies on operant behavior, in which the behavior of the test subject precedes a change in environment. If you taught a dog that only through salivating it would get food, that would be operant conditioning. What Ivan Pavlov is to classical conditioning, B.F. Skinner is to operant conditioning. Skinner created the so-called Skinner box, aka an operant chamber, in which a rat learned to press a lever and receive food. This simple device illustrates the law of effect, or the idea that rewarded behavior is more likely to recur and punished behavior will occur less. This process is called shaping, or using procedures which reinforce certain behaviors to get closer and closer to a desired behavior. So shaping can occur in two main ways, positive and negative reinforcement. In positive reinforcement, you add a desirable stimulus, such as giving someone money every time they do a job well done. During our junior year, Abe's mom used to give him a Pop-Tart every time he aced a test. Yum. In negative reinforcement, you remove something bad, like closing your door to drown out your brother's terrible music, or a teacher allowing you to take off the dunce cap and rejoin the class. Remember that negative reinforcement is not punishment, but the removal of something bad. If anything, it's the opposite of punishment. This reinforcement is delivered through either primary or conditioned reinforcers. Primary reinforcers satisfy innate biological needs, such as drinking when you're thirsty. Conditioned reinforcers, also known as secondary reinforcers, are gained through association with primary reinforcers. Money would be an example of a conditioned reinforcer, as it can buy food to satiate hunger or a bottle of water to satiate thirst. Did you know that the French, whose hope had been the, to use EMU to constrain German monetary power, gave in to a final bargain that proposed stiff convergence criteria obligating EMU applicants to lower budget deficits to 3% and longer term debt to 60% of GDP? System.out.print line boring. True enough. Anyway, thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. And comment down below if you have any questions, especially for this video since it has so many bold terms. We'll catch you guys next time.